freedom of time, which means 801. So <laughs> on that note, um, I am honored to open for the Dr. Gabriella Della Piana. Dr. D, as she introduces herself graciously to patients, earned her Bachelor of Science at the University of Utah in exercise physiology, attended med school at UCSF, and then completed her residency and fellowship here at Cedar sinai She is certainly dangerously in love with Cedars, as she is now an assistant professor in maternal fetal medicine and entering her ninth year here. No B-Day or Grand Round celebration would be complete without a listing of her incredible accolades. Already impressive during her training as a former Gates Millennium Scholar, elected chief resident, and recipient of four times two equals eight honors and special awards, Dr. D's renaissance has put her at the forefront of MFM clinical care and our specialty. Dr. D cares for patients here at Tarzana, at Planned Parenthood Los Angeles, and lends her expertise to several local Cedars communities, including the Perinatal Anti-Discrimination Health Collaborative and OBAN, as well as to the ACOG District 9 Perinatal Safety and Quality Initiative and the SMFM Clinical Informatics Committee. She has published on topics as ranging as perioperative cesarean care, hemorrhage, and COVID. She also has black belts in both karate and taekwondo, so take this into consideration before you consider formation against her. In conclusion, I think everyone in attendance here would consider themselves members of the Dehive, and so let's all raise a glass of lemonade. It is, of course, 8 a.m., as she is truly Dr. Della Piana Fierce. All right, thanks, Gabby. Take it away. That was so fabulous. I wish I had recorded <laughs> that entire thing. The number of Beyonce references, I could just cry right now. <laughs> so thank you so, so much for that amazing introduction. <laughs> Let me just pull up my slides here. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about obesity and pregnancy, kind of sticking with the theme of uh, exercise and well-being that we kind of went through in my last grand rounds. And so just thank you, everyone, for um, having me back again. <laughs> All right. So I don't have any disclosures. For our outline of our talk today, we're going to start with what is the definition of obesity and spend a little time talking about prevalence and how it's been rising. We're going to focus uh, for a minute on how to have a compassionate conversation about weight with patients and then uh, switch gears to the obstetric risks and pregnancy management. We'll touch for just a hot second on interpregnancy management of obesity as well. All right, so to start with the definition. So the World Health Organization defined weight classifications based on BMI as are listed below. So BMI, as we know, is calculated in kilograms per meter square of weight over height. Underweight would be a BMI of less than 18.5. Normal weight is 18.5 to 25. Overweight, 25 to 30. And then obesity is a body mass index of greater than or equal to 30. Um, obesity is further broken into three categories. So class one is a BMI of 30 to 35, class two, 35 to 40, and then class three would be 40 or above. The prevalence of obesity in the United States has been increasing over time. This graph from the National Center for Health Statistics shows the trend in rates of obesity in U.S. adults from 1999 to 2018. The top black line encompasses all classes of obesity, and then the bottom green line, which is what they're calling severe obesity, is class 3 obes obesity specifically. We can see that the prevalence of obesity has increased from 30% to 42%, and the prevalence of class 3 obesity has increased from 5% to 9% in both men and women. Looking at just women who are aged 20 to 39, which they coined reproductive age, but misses a large cohort of our Cedars pregnant population, <laughs> the prevalence of obesity was 40% in 2018. But not all women of reproductive age will have a pregnancy. So when we look just at those who become pregnant, the rate of pre-pregnancy obesity in 2019 was 29%, which is up just a smidge from 26% in 2016. The prevalence of obesity varies in different race and ethnicity groups. This bar chart shows data from women who are 20 or older. Rates of obesity are lowest among non-Hispanic Asian women at 17% as compared to 40% in non-Hispanic white women, 44% in Hispanic women, and 57% in non-Hispanic black women. 
But again, we'll take a step back and look at just people who become pregnant. So rates of pre-pregnancy obesity are 27% in non-Hispanic white, which was up from 10% in 2016, 32% in Hispanic women, up from 12% in 2016, and 39% for non-Hispanic black women, which is up 7% from 2016. Uh, this natality database did not have pre-pregnancy data for non-Hispanic Asians. And then lastly, obesity is not a geographically confined issue. Rates of obesity have increased nationwide. The map below shows the prevalence of pre-pregnancy obesity in each state with the colors indicating the percent change from 2016 to 2019. The only state that didn't increase over time was New Hampshire. That's the one in light blue. Um, Pre-pregnancy obesity increased by uh, under 10% in 22 states, between 10 to 14% in 26 states, by an impressive 22% in Arkansas, the dark blue. In 2019, the area with the lowest rate of pre-pregnancy obesity was Washington, D.C., at 22.5% compared to a high of 38% in Mississippi. And here in California, we're at about 26 and a half. All right, so now we're going to switch gears to an important conversation, which is how to uh, have a compassionate conversation about obesity. Obesity is a medical condition and should be treated as such. It's a highly stigmatized condition in modern society, even though weight is a continuum and there's not a BMI cutoff at which a person necessarily crosses from being healthy to unhealthy. Healthcare professionals may harbor implicit bias towards patients with obesity, which can result in disrespectful or inadequate delivery of care. An OBGYN should engage in self-reflection to identify any personal implicit biases and take steps to address them when present so that we can provide effective, compassionate medical care that meets the needs of our patients with obesity. If you haven't already heard of or taken the implicit association tests that are available through the Harvard Project Implicit, I highly recommend that you do. They have a really wide array of different topics that you can explore in terms of identifying your personal implicit associations, and one of them is on sizeism. And so the way the implicit association test works is they, uh, for our topic specifically sizeism, they give you uh, categories of uh, um, words and pictures. So the pictures would represent what they're calling thin or fat people, and then the words are correlated with good or bad associations. They uh, um, set you up such that one key indicates one thing and the other key indicates another and they tell you how they want you to sort it and the sorting changes several times throughout the course of the test. The whole test is done within 10 minutes and the idea is to go as quickly as you can so that you're getting at your subconscious level. Um, this is a test that I did back in medical school, and then I retook it in preparation for this talk and am glad to realize that um, my own uh, implicit bias has improved over time because by becoming aware of it now, what, 15 years ago, <laughs> um, I cognizantly uh, work towards um, providing unbiased care, and it seems to reflect in improved scores, which is fabulous. So highly recommend that you all try this. Um, if you just type in implicit association test into Google or go to this website below, you'll be able to find it. Um, in continuing on having a compassionate conversation, it's important to use person-centered language. So person-centered language emphasizes the person first rather than the illness. So rather than saying obese patients, the preferred terminology would be patients with obesity. This requires a cognitive switch that's likely a little different from how many of us commonly discuss patients with various conditions. And I'm gonna do my best to stick to person-centered language throughout the presentation. Um, it also is relevant when we think about our coding diagnoses. So uh, ACOG suggests for when you're coding for obesity and pregnancy to use these codes listed here, which are 099.21 and its derivatives for the different trimesters. And the terminology is obesity complicating pregnancy. 
However, I want to point out that um, there are other codes that are in, in terms of the description that are the same code. And uh, what the patient sees is the descriptor that you choose. So using that same 099.21, you can find obesity affecting pregnancy, obesity during pregnancy, and obesity in a pregnancy. So my personal preference is to use obesity in pregnancy rather than complicating. And it's important to avoid these other codes or these other descriptors, which are under the same code, which use the term morbid as a descriptor. Um, there's, and to be fair, um, the ICD-10 guidelines also suggest that using a BMI um, code specifically in pregnancy is prohibited um, for patients with obesity or who are overweight. But again, just be cognizant of the word choice that the patients will see in your descriptors because you'll get the same billing code. Uh, motivational interviewing is one means of having a constructive conversation about behavior change. The basic communication style is ORs, open-ended questions that encourage elaboration, affirmations of the patient's positive thoughts, actions, or ideas, reflections that indicate that the clinician has heard and accurately understood the patient, and summarize to clarify the motivation and focus the session. So the steps for motivational interviewing include first to engage. So you should start by asking permission to discuss the behavioral health topic with the person and engage the person using those open-ended questions we talked about, those empathic reflections, autonomy supportive affirmations, and then roll with resistance as needed. And then you want to focus by reflecting, summarizing, and developing discrepancies. And then respectfully evoke the patient's thoughts, feelings, motivations, and underlying concerns that might increase or decrease motivation to change. And then the next step is to talk about a plan for a change. In some cases, the plan may just be to talk about it again later if the person isn't ready. And people are more likely to follow through with a change when they have a specific plan and express to another person their intention to carry it out. Um, during prenatal visits, all patients should be counseled on physical activity, diet, and nutrition, as well as assessed for obesity or disordered eating. So it helps to normalize the conversation about weight if you review weight like you would any other vital sign. For example, we've gone over your blood pressure and your labs. Let's talk about your weight. Is this an okay time to have that conversation? And you, it's also important to weigh patients privately rather than in a common space. And then uh, the last thing is to make sure that you have appropriate equipment to care for patients of different BMIs. So that requires having larger size chairs, larger blood pressure cuffs and wheelchairs. And this increase in equipment size does necessitate increasing storage space and possibly the number of staff to safely assist patients. Um, birthing beds and operating room tables should be able to accommodate the size and weight of patients with obesity, um, just to know the the typical operating room table accommodates 450 pounds. You want to have appropriate fetal monitoring equipment. And so it's great that we have the Monica Novi here at Cedars because that um, works well in patients with obesity where external monitoring is not working quite as well. And then you have the alternative option of internalization. Operating rooms should be equipped with motorized lifts or inflatable hover pads to help transfer patients onto or off of the operating room tables. And protection of patient pressure areas is important to avoid neural injuries and pressure sores. You also wanna make sure that patients have safety belts on and gel pads to help prevent movement of the patient on the table when you're going into different positions like Trendelenburg or a left lateral tilt. And then longer instruments to facilitate surgeons access to tissue planes is important. And uh, um, something that I discovered in preparing for this talk is that ACOG actually has this series called Compassionate Conversations, and their first published talk was on obesity. Um, they also have a talk on hepatitis C in patients and are developing further ones. But this was a really lovely 45-minute webinar moderated by Dr. Louise King, who's a MIG surgeon at Harvard. And the speakers included high-achieving women who are directors of business development for a podcast network, the program director for a bariatric program, and a entrepreneur, entrepreneur who founded Bariatrically Blessed. And it was a very um, enlightening conversation about these three people's personal 
journey with weight and weight loss management. All right, so we'll switch gears here. Now we're going to talk about the pregnancy complications associated with obesity. So we'll start with maternal complications. Obesity is a risk factor for the development of type 2 diabetes. So if screening was never performed or not performed recently, patients may not be aware that they have diabetes. You want to consider early diabetes screening in patients who are overweight or obese and have one or more of the following risk factors. I'm not going to read them off. I'll let you just peruse those. <laughs> um, there's also an increased risk for gestational diabetes due to an exaggerated increase in insulin resistance in the setting of obesity. So data from the FASTER consortium, which was a prospective multi-center trial of 16,000 patients, showed an incidence of gestational diabetes of about 2% in patients with normal weight or overweight BMI, compared to 6% in patients with class 1 obesity and 9.5% in patients with class 2 obesity or higher. Data from meta-analyses has demonstrated that the risk for gestational diabetes increases by about 1% for each point in BMI increase, and that the odds for GDM compared to patients of normal weight is twice as high in patients with an overweight BMI, three and a half times as high with class 1 obesity, and eight and a half times as high in patients with class 2 obesity or higher. Um, Preeclampsia is also at increased risk, so body mass index is, has been consistently shown to be a risk factor for hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. This may be due to higher baseline insulin resistance, hyperlipidemia, and oxidative stretch, which, um, which are related to obesity related to cardiovascular risks. Adipose tissue is also a high source of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which can promote the expression of maternal anti-angiogenic factors that have been implicated in the pathogenesis of preeclampsia. In one systematic review of 13 cohort studies that included one and a half million patients, they found that the risk for preeclampsia approximately doubles for every five to seven point increase in BMI. Ergo, as we increase from each class of the normal weight, overweight, class one, class two, class three, there is an approximate doubling of risk. It's hard to find current overall prevalences. Data from the FASTER consortium is from 2004, and they reported only a 3% risk of preeclampsia in patients with class 1 obesity versus 6% with class 2 obesity or above. Um, and it might just be my exposure bias to CEDARS, where our numbers are generally just much higher in all patients. Um, but here's the general trend. Mm -hmm. Um, their patients with obesity are also more prone to obstructive sleep apnea. OSA should be suspected with symptoms of snoring, excessive daytime sleepiness, witnessed apneas, or unexplained hypoxia. You can refer a patient with these symptoms to a sleep medicine specialist for evaluation and possible treatment. Patients with OSA are at a higher risk for several adverse cardiovascular outcomes, hypoxemia, hypercapnia, and sudden death. In a retrospective review of a nationwide database of over 55 million delivery discharges, they found that after adjusting for obesity and other potential confounders, obstructive sleep apnea was associated with a two and a half times higher odds for preeclampsia, five and a half times higher odds for eclampsia, nine times higher odds for cardiomyopathy, and four and a half times higher odds for pulmonary embolism, accumulating in a more than five times higher odds for in-hospital mortality. The adverse effects of OSA on selected outcomes are exacerbated by obesity, which is shown in the table here. The associations between OSA and preeclampsia, congestive heart failure, and cardiomyopathy were stronger in patients who had comorbid obesity than in patients without comorbid obesity. Those are those rows highlighted in yellow. However, the associations between OSA and stroke, PE, acute renal failure, and in-hospital mortality were not significantly increased by a joint diagnosis of obesity. So in patients who have obstructive sleep apnea and obesity, you want to consider an anesthesia consult prior to admission. Carpal tunnel is also increased in patients with obesity. When patients start to experience symptoms, they usually recommend that they pick up a wrist splint that you can get over the counter to wear at night to assist with symptoms. Unfortunately, once carpal tunnel kind of sets in, it doesn't usually improve until after delivery and may take months to improve at that point as well. <laughs> 
um, patients with obesity are also more likely to have post-term pregnancies. One hypothesis is that gestational age calculated from the last menstrual period overestimates the true fetal age because patients with obesity tend to be oligoovulatory. And this hypothesis is supported by studies of early ultrasound assessments of gestational age in this population that found that the EDD by LMP was earlier than the EDD by ultrasound. Obesity-related hormonal changes may also interfere with the hormonal pathways for the initiation of partuition and delay its onset, probably by affecting the propagation and synchronization of uterine contractions. Patients with obesity have also been shown to have a longer first stage of labor. In a large study that included 120,000 patients, they demonstrated that the median time for patients to dilate from four to 10 centimeters, because this was back when four was active labor and now six is the new four, <laughs> um, they demonstrated that um, after adjusting for confounders, increased the time from going from four centimeters to 10 centimeters increased with increasing BMI category. So it took on average five and a half hours for patients with normal weight, six hours for patients with class one obesity, six and a half hours for class two obesity, and seven and a half hours for those with class three obesity. This trend was true in both nulliparis and multiparis. And I know that these graphs are too small to read, but the intention is just to show the trends. So time is increasing along the X axis and body mass index increases with each color moving to the right. Therefore, we may need to consider allowing more time before diagnosing either a failed induction of labor or rest of dilation in patients with obesity. And notably, the duration of the second stage doesn't differ by BMI class. The risk for cesarean delivery also increases with increasing BMI category. In the U.S. in 2020, the cesarean birth rate was lowest in patients who were underweight at 21% and then rose steadily to 52% for patients with class 3 obesity. Obesity-related pregnancy complications, higher infant birth weight, and increased frequency of preterm and postterm birth account for some of the excess risk of cesarean birth. However, obesity also appears to be an independent risk factor, possibly because of the adverse effects on labor progress, as described before. And then there are some special considerations when it comes to anesthesia. So placement of neuraxial anesthesia may be more technically difficult in patients with obesity due to body habitus and loss of landmarks. Pregnant patients with obesity have been reported to have higher rates of multiple attempts at placement, inadvertent dural puncture, and failed analgesia requiring a re repeat procedure, as well as higher hypotension related to uh, regional anesthesia. And then if general anesthesia is required, obesity is one of the factors that's predictive of a difficult airway due to excessive tissue and edema. So consideration should be made for pre-oxygenation, proper patient positioning, and availability of fiber, op fiber optic equipment. Pregnant patients with obesity are also at a higher risk for postpartum infections, such as wound infection or endometritis, regardless of mode of delivery and despite the use of prophylactic antibiotics. Poor vascularity of subcutaneous adipose tissue and formation of seromas and hematomas account at least in part for this increased risk of wound infection. And there is um, also a higher risk for venothromboembolism. So uh, some major risk factors for VTE are obesity, pregnancy, the postpartum state, and cesarean delivery. All of these are independent risk factors. And data from one meta-analysis showed that the adjusted odds of postpartum venothromboembolism increased with increasing BMI category compared to patients with normal BMI, with the odds at class one being two and a half and odds at class three being four and a half times higher. And this was after adjusting for age, serine delivery infection, and postpartum hemorrhage. All right, so we'll move on to some of the fetal complications. So there is a higher rate of spontaneous abortion. Compared to patients with normal BMI, the odds of having at least one miscarriage is increased by 30% in patients with obesity. The underlying cause for this increased risk is unclear. One mechanism for excess early loss of euploid embryos may be endometrial inflammation related to PCOS. Um, there is also pregnant people with obesity are at increased risk for congenital anomalies. These include neural tube defects, cardiac malformations, oral facial defects, and limb reduction anomalies. 
However, the data is limited by incompletely controlling for diabetes or poor first trimester glycemic control in many of the studies, and diabetes is an established risk factor for fetal anomalies. So this may explain some or even all of the increased risk that's reported in these studies. Um, interestingly, the risk for gastroschisis among patients with obesity is significantly reduced by 80%. Um, there is also, <clears throat> unfortunately, a reduced antenatal detection rate of congenital malformations. In an evaluation of 8,500 patients from the FASTER trial consortium, maternal obesity decreased the likelihood of sonographic detection of common anomalies by about 30%. And things that were included in common anomalies were like a thickened nuchal fold, echogenic bowel, short long bones, echogenic intracardiac focus, urinary tract dilation, and cardiac anomalies, because the FASTER trial was really focusing on um, ultrasound findings that could uh, increase risk for aneuploidy. Uh, obesity increases the risk of medically indicated preterm birth as well. In a systematic review, pregnant patients who were overweight or, or obese had a 30% increased risk of induced preterm birth compared to those with normal BMI. Uh, there doesn't appear to be a consistent association with increased risk for spontaneous preterm birth. Um, and both pre-pregnancy obesity and gestational weight gain play an important role in determining birth weight. Several studies have reported that increasing pre-pregnancy weight has a linear relationship with birth weight, independent of the increased prevalence of gestational diabetes in patients with obesity. Macrosomic or large for gestational age infants are associated with some increased maternal and neonatal risks. Um, maternal risks include higher likelihood for cesarean, higher order perineal laceration, postpartum hemorrhage, and choreo. And the most important neonatal risk is shoulder dystocia. The risk is reported to be 9 to 14% for a birth weight that is greater than 4,500 grams or about 10 pounds. And it's 20 to 50% if there is comor comorbid diabetes with a birth weight of 4,500 grams. Other neonatal complications of macrosomia include hypoglycemia, respiratory distress, polycythemia, a longer NICU stay, and excessive childhood weight gain. Um, unfortunately, the risk for IFD is also increased. So while the absolute risk for stillbirth remains low, there is an increased risk seen in patients with obesity by about two per 1,000 compared to patients with normal weight. One large meta-analysis, including tens of thousands of fetal and neonatal losses, showed that for every five-unit increase in maternal BMI above 25, the relative risk of fetal death was 20% higher. In a large population-based cohort, they found that after controlling for maternal age, nulliparity, and comorbid conditions, the hazard ratio for stillbirth um, was about 1.7 with a pre-pregnancy BMI that was class 1 obesity, about 2 for class 2, and 2.5 two and for class 3. And then for patients with a BMI of 50 or higher, the hazard ratio for stillbirth was three times higher compared to those with with um, a BMI less than 30. And black patients with obesity experience even more stillbirths than white patients with obesity. Race is not a biologic risk factor for stillbirth and it's likely a proxy for the negative influence of racism on health. And then lastly, um, Patients with obesity are more likely to have children with obesity. Maternal obesity may affect long-term offspring outcomes as a result of epigenetic changes induced by fetal exposure to increased levels of glucose, insulin, lipids, and inflammatory cytokines during development. These in utero effects may cause permanent or transient changes in metabolic programming, leading to adverse health, com adverse health outcomes in adult life. And so this is the Barker hypothesis or fetal origins of adult disease theory. All right, so we're going to switch gears here now to talking about pregnancy management in patients with obesity. Because, of course, this is coming from MFM. <laughs> so um, first, as we consider what are the recommendations for gestational weight gain for patients with obesity, I think we first have to consider what is the physiologic weight gain of pregnancy. So just looking at the products of conception, which are your fetus, the amniotic fluid, and the placenta, and the mandatory uterine enlargement that occurs, we're already looking at a 12 and a half to 13 and a half pound weight gain. 
And then you add into that increases in blood volume, extravascular fluid volume, and breast enlargement. Now we're sitting at 18 and a half to 23 and a half pounds. And that's not even taking into account any increase in fat stores, which would bump us up to 24 and a half to 31 and a half pounds. And despite that physiologic weight gain, we are asking patients with obesity to gain no more than 11 to 20 pounds. So this comes from the Institute of Medicine, which is now called the National Academy of Medicine's Recommendations for Gestational Weight Gain by BMI Category in 2009. And for patients with all classes of obesity, so BMI 30 or higher, the recommended total weight gain is between 11 and 20 pounds, which equates to being about a half a pound per week in the second and third trimesters in singleton pregnancies, assuming a one to four pound weight gain in the first trimester. And then in multiple gestation it's recommended to gain between 20, more twins specifically, recommended to gain between 25 and 42 pounds. Um, it's important, though, that um, inadequate weight gain or weight loss not be encouraged because compared to gestational weight gain that is within these recommended guidelines, patients who have a gestational weight loss or um, a less than 11 pound weight gain are at a higher odds of having a small for gestational age infant with an adjusted odds of 1.8. So how can we meet this goal of just 11 to 20 pounds? Um, a Cochrane review of 49 randomized control trials in 11,000 patients found that high quality evidence showed that interventions of diet or exercise or both during pregnancy help to reduce excessive gestational weight gain by 20% compared to controls. So whether the intervention was a low glycemic load diet, supervised or unsupervised exercise only, or diet and exercise combined, all led to similar reductions in the number of patients gaining excessive weight in pregnancy. So I'd recommend considering a nutrition consult early in pregnancy to assist with the dietary component. And for exercise, patients are recommended to have at least 150 minutes of modern intensity aerobic physical activity spread over at least three to four days of the week, as well as resistance training on at least two days per week. Um, we previously discussed that some patients would be candidates for early diabetes screening, and uh, we didn't read them off before, but some examples of a patient who should have early GDM screening would be someone who has obesity and either a history of diabetes in a prior pregnancy, you guys all know history of is a great answer, um, pre-diabetes, history of a macrosomic infant, meaning weighing more than four grams, or sorry, four kilograms, um, which is about nine pounds, physical inactivity a first-degree relative with diabetes, PCOS, um, or physical signs of insulin resistance such as acanthosis nigricans. And then other risk factors would be high-risk races, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, history of cardiovascular disease, or class 3 obesity they list. And then aspirin should also be recommended in uh, certain pregnancies. So uh, low-dose aspirin for preeclampsia risk reduction is recommended if a patient has at least one high risk factor or two moderate risk factors. Obesity is one moderate risk factor. And so if they are also either nulliparous or black or advanced maternal age or an IVF conception, then they are a candidate for low-dose aspirin therapy regardless of any of these high-risk factors. Um, and then the next step to think about is aneuploidy screening. So options for aneuploidy screening in patients with obesity are the same as for patients with normal weight. The best non-invasive option is cell-free DNA. However, there is a slightly increased risk for test failure secondary to low fetal fraction in patients with obesity. Cell-free DNA requires a minimum fetal fraction of 2 to 4%, and in patients weighing more than 250 pounds, 10% will have a fetal fraction that is under 4%. This is thought to be due to a dilutional effect. The risk of test failure increases by about 5% with each additional BMI unit increase. A no-call result on cell-free DNA is associated with an increased risk for aneuploidy. So if a patient has a no-call result, they should be offered genetic counseling and diagnostic genetic testing. 
Repeat screening may be considered, but it delays a diagnostic test, and it's not advised if the screening results are consistent with ultrasound anomalies or if the patient is at a gestational age in which a delay may compromise their reproductive options. Success of repeat sampling after test failure in a general screening population is about 75 to 80%, but it is substantially lower in patients with obesity. And then our diagnostic genetic testing options are chorionic villus sampling and amniocentesis. Um, patients should be counseled about the limitations of ultrasound and that the detection of anomalies may be reduced in pregnancies with obesity and ultrasounds may take longer to complete. I'm sorry if you're hearing some background noise, there is some construction happening next to me. Um, so to help with I obtaining better ultrasound images, you want to find alternative acoustic windows. So you can try a vaginal approach in the first trimester. You can use various maneuvers that displace the paniculus and thereby decrease the depth through which images are being obtained. So for example, on the far left, you can scan underneath the paniculus. You see that the patient is assisting by lifting the abdomen upwards. You can scan above the paniculus. And so in the second picture, there is an assistant who is pulling the panis downwards. Um, you can ultrasound in a lateral position, which helps to displace the paniculus to the side, or the umbilicus can be used as an acoustic window by filling it with ultrasound gel and scanning through it, or alternatively, the transvaginal probe can be used through the umbilicus given its small footprint. I will say that I've tried the transvaginal ultrasound through the umbilicus trick before, and it did not have great results for me, but um, still worth considering. Uh, there's also different settings on the machine that you can use, such as penetration or FFC, which is focus frequency composite, or tissue harmonic imaging. And MRI is not routinely recommended due to cost and availability. Um, during pregnancy, more frequent ultrasound may be required to monitor fetal growth because of a decreased ability to assess growth with routine physical exam alone. Antenatal testing is also suggested for patients with class 2 or class 3 obesity, starting weekly at 37 weeks for class 2 obesity and weekly at 34 weeks for class 3 obesity. There's no specific recommendation from ACOG and SMFM for class 1 obesity in the absence of other risk factors. The rationale for antenatal testing beginning as early as 34 weeks for class 3 obesity is that the adjusted hazard ratio for intrauterine fetal demise is 40% higher and, in, and then increases to three times higher at 37 to 39 weeks. Um, in terms of delivery timing, ACOG and SMFM don't make a formal recommendation on delivery timing for patients with obesity, but my suggestion is that for any patient who you're performing antenatal testing due to a concern for an increased risk for intrauterine fetal demise, delivery should occur at least by the EDC. And then there are some uh, considerations for patients who require a cesarean. Um, the first is surgical exposure. So a removable adhesive panis retractor slash retention system or surgical tape placed prior to the start of the C-section for rostral retraction may improve exposure without the concern for pressure points that can be caused by manual retraction. And so I understand that at Cedars, we now have the Traxi system, which is demonstrated there on the left um, or the old school way of just using the tape. Um, in terms of skin incision type, the optimal skin incision is unknown, but it may uh, data may lean towards supporting a transverse incision. So options for skin incision include a fan and steel, an infra umbilical vertical incision, a super umbilical vertical incision, or a super umbilical transverse incision. In many studies, if the patient had a hanging panis where the umbilicus was at the level of the pubic bone, then surgeons opted for a super umbilical incision, either vertical or transverse. 
A disadvantage of making an incision under the panis is that the wound must heal in a warmer, more moist environment with a higher bacterial colonization, which would theoretically increase the risk of infection. However, studies haven't really shown this increased risk of infection. So one systematic review of uh, 3,000 patients found that a low transverse skin incision actually had a 50% lower rate of wound complication compared to a vertical skin incision in patients with obesity. Obesity. And then another more recent retrospective review of 3,000 patients with class 3 obesity found that there was no difference in wound morbidity if the patient had a fan and still incision versus a vertical incision. So that's encouraging. One of the disadvantages of using supra umbilical incisions is that exposure to the lower uterine segment can be suboptimal, necessitating a vertical hysterotomy or a classical hysterotomy. Um, sometimes it may even require extracting a vertex presenting fetus as a breach. And vertical skin incisions have been associated with both higher median surgical blood loss and an increase in total surgical time by 30 minutes compared to fan stills. Um, subcutaneous drains are not recommended as randomized trials have shown no clear benefit in the overall obstetric population or in patients with obesity who have a subcutaneous closure. But subcutaneous closure when there's at least two centimeters of adipose tissue is recommended. Um, and then in regards to negative pressure wound dressings, further data are needed before this can be recommended routinely. In a meta-analysis of prophylactic negative pressure wound therapy versus standard care after cesarean in patients with obesity, which included 5,500 patients, the um, negative pressure intervention reduced the risk of skin and soft tissue infection compared to the standard wound dressing by 20%, so it decreased it from 8% to 2%, but it didn't reduce the rate of other wound complications like dehiscence, seroma, or bleeding, or readmission, or reoperation, and it did increase skin blistering. Some of the limitations of these trials, though, to be aware of are that it included practice vari variations in surgical care, such as the skin antisepsis, incision type, skin closure technique, and prophylactic antibiotic timing and dose. Um, so uh, hard to draw conclusions with the currently available data. Um, so to talk about antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, first there's a question of what dose to provide with patients with obesity. Cephalosporins have an increased volume of distribution and drug clearance in patients with obesity. And guidelines from numerous societies, the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, the Infectious Disease Society of America, the Surgical Infection Society, and the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America all recommend using a three gram dose of cevazolin for patients who have are weigh at least 120 kilograms undergoing cesarean birth for prophylaxis, and then two grams for patients who are under 120 kilograms. Um, this weight-based dosing approach is, appro is supported by data from cohort studies in which patients with obesity who received two grams of cefazolin did not have antibiotic tissue concentrations that met the minimum inhibitory concentration for gram-negative rods at the time of skin incision or skin closure. However, randomized trials haven't shown a significant difference in tissue concentrations between two grams or three grams dosing. So per ACOG, the benefit of administering three grams in obstetric patients weighing 120 kilograms or more has not yet been established. Um, our current order set suggests using the increased dose when patients weigh 120 kilograms or more, which I think is reasonable. And then uh, there is the question of whether or not post-cesarean antibiotic prophylaxis should be provided because of the increased risk for wound infection and endometritis. So there is one clinical trial, which I know the residents are really well versed in, which showed a decrease in surgical site infection in patients with obesity who received postoperative prophylaxis. This was performed by Valent et al. in uh, 2017, and it was a single center double blind trial that randomized patients post cesarean to receiving cephalexin 500 milligrams Q8 hours and metronidazole 500 milligrams Q8 hours PO for a total of 48 hours compared to placebo. Them. The patients receiving, all the patients in the study received a standard two gram dose. There wasn't a three gram dose for higher um, weight. 
and uh, surgical site infection was lower in the antibiotic prophylaxis group by 60%, decreasing rates from 15 to 6%. But notably, the study was in its final year of data collection when the CSOAP trial came out, showing that a decrease in post-cesarean surgical site infection with the addition of adjunctive azithromycin for patients with labor or rupture of membranes was evident. Um, and the rate of the post-op surgical site infections was similar in the CSOAP trial and this Valent trial at about 6% for patients who received antibiotics. Therefore, it's unclear if the benefit of additional oral antibiotics from the Valent study would exceed that of adjunctive azithromycin at the time of cesarean. So ACOG states, in patients with obesity who may not have received adjunctive azithromycin prophylaxis, then this postoperative oral regimen can be considered of Keflex plus Flagyl for 48 hours. So who would that be? That would be patients who are scheduled cesareans, who have intact membranes and are not in labor. Then there is the question that always comes up about anticoagulation um, or venal thromboembolism prophylaxis. So all patients should have a mechanical prophylaxis, SCDs, placed during the C-section and afterwards. Um, and the SCD should be kept in place until the patient is ambulating regularly. And all patients should be encouraged to have early ambulation uh, within the first eight hours after surgery. And then you can consider prophylactic anticoagulation according to ACOG if a patient has multiple risk factors. And we're talking about the average patient who doesn't have a history of VTE or thrombophilia. Um, and the risk factors would be obesity or cesarean delivery. Um, or prolonged immobility or a first degree relative with a history of VTE. Uh, but but ACOG is a little wishy-washy on it where they say you can either do surveillance or you can do prophylaxis. Um, CMQCC, which is the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative Coalition, sorry if I'm getting that um, acronym a little bit incorrect, they recommend using um, um, chemoprophylaxis in patients who have two major or one major and two minor risk factors. And the risk factors are written here, and we can see that under major, cesarean delivery and class two or above obesity are listed. And so uh, um, something that we can maybe reevaluate here at Cedars in terms of if we want to be a little bit more standardized in our approach, but these are what the current recommendations or suggestions are. You can do it or not do it, but everyone should wear SEDs. And then the other thing to consider is um, caring for patients post-bariatric surgery. So uh, there, in terms of types of bariatric or surgery, there are restrictive surgeries, which are like the gastric band or sleeve gastrectomy. There are malabsorptive surgeries, which are the bypasses like the Roux and Y or a duodenal switch. And uh, I've color coded these just to kind of as we go through what are the things we think about restrictive being red and malabsorptive being blue. So for both types of surgery, we can see micronutrient deficiencies. The most common nutritional deficiency after a malabsorptive or Roux and Y gastric bypass are protein, iron, vitamin B12, folate, vitamin D, and calcium. So you should test for micronutri micronutrient deficiencies at the initial prenatal visit and then replete as needed. If you are doing repletion, then continue to check them monthly. And then the recommendation is to uh, monitor the CBC, iron, ferritin, calcium, and vitamin D every trimester, and vitamin B12 every trimester. Those are the ones highlighted in blue. Uh, you can also see nutritional deficiencies after the restrictive surgeries, though, such as the gastric band, um, usually due to decreased food intake and intolerance to certain foods. Some experts advise that you can do active band management, whereby fluid from the gastric band is removed or lessened in time to allow for less to gastric constriction and increase the patient's oral intake or to help relieve uh, nausea and vomiting of the first trimester. There's no consensus on adjustable band management, but early consultation with a bariatric surgeon is recommended. There is an increased risk for SGA infants and in patients who've had bariatric surgery, more so in patients with malabsorptive procedures than restrictive, but it's also seen in patients who conceive within less than two years after having bariatric surgery because they are still experiencing the most rapid um, point of weight loss and may not yet have plateaued. So serial ultrasounds for growth are recommended. 
Um, Dumping syndrome is a risk post gastric bypass, so in the malabsorptives, um, and it occurs with ingestion of refined sugars or high glycemic carbs and that the stomach rapidly empties into the small intestine, leading to fluid shifts from the intravascular compartment into the bowel lumen, causing small bowel distension. So the patient experiences abdominal cramping, bloating, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and then later effects can include hyperinsulinemia and consequent hypoglycemia, tachycardia, palpitations, anxiety, and diaphoresis. So patients with dumping syndrome, i.e. those who have had bypass surgeries, may not tolerate the um, glucola for gestational diabetes screening, and so you want to use alternative measures such as finger sticks for one week during between 24 and 28 weeks. Um, post ruin y gastric bypass, the absorptive surface of the intestines is decreased, and so extended release preparations are not recommended when we're considering medications in pregnancy. You may need to instead use oral solutions or rapid release formulations. So that becomes relevant when you are thinking about blood pressure medications and a patient is like, should you start labetalol or should you start nif nifedipine XL? Um, and somebody with a ruin y maybe uh, labetalol would be a better option rather than the extended release. Um, the gastric pouch is also smaller in both types of procedures, and so caution against NSAIDs postpartum is warranted to avoid gastric ulceration. And if you're using a medication in which therapeutic drug levels are critical, such as antiepileptics, then you should test drug levels throughout the course of the pregnancy. And then lastly, a high index of suspicion for GI surgical complications should be had in patients who are presenting with um, significant abdominal symptoms who've had these procedures because they can have complications like bowel obstruction or anastomotic leak. Okay, so we're going to touch just for a hot second on interpregnancy or pre-pregnancy management. So weight loss pre-pregnancy is the most effective intervention to improve medical conditions, and even small weight reductions like a 5% weight loss can improve pregnancy outcomes. Um, so we can use that motivational interviewing that we talked about before, uh, diet, exercise, as we previously discussed. Bariatric surgery is one means, and it's recommended to wait 12 to 24 months after bariatric surgery before conceiving to uh, miss that window in which patients are at their most rapid weight loss, um, which can have negative effects on the pregnancy. So contraception in patients who have bariatric surgery is important um, and something that's not a combined oral contraceptive pill because it's less efficacious. And then medications, I just wanted to mention because I feel like a lot of us have become much more aware of the GLP-1 agonists, which are um, intended to help with diabetes treatment, but also have significant improvements in weight loss. And so in some patients have been used primarily for weight loss. So these include semaglutide, which is ozempic, terzepatide, which is monjaro, and liraglutide, which is saxenda. Um, so uh, there is no safety data on the, these GLP-1 agonists in pregnancy, and if you have people on these GLP-1 agonist receptors, it's important to know about side effects that they might experience, such as nausea, vomiting, stomach pains, headache, dizziness, fatigue, constipation, diarrhea, GERD, hypoglycemia in patients with type 2 diabetes, or other drug interactions. Um, less common side effects might include uh, acute pancreatitis or cholelithiasis, and rarely like suicidal thoughts or behavior or risk of thyroid C cell tumors. Um, it's recommended currently to discontinue these medications at least three months prior to conception, but I wanted to put in a little plug that we're going to be starting a registry here at Cedars to monitor the pregnancy outcomes of patients who have had exposures to these GLP-1 agonists um, at some point in the year preceding pregnancy or potentially incidentally became pregnant while taking those medications. So keep an eye out for a fly with more information in the future if you would like to help recruit patients to this registry to better understand what the pregnancy risks may be.
And then there's a couple other great websites in terms of resources for patients with obesity who are um, either looking for weight loss solutions or looking for community. One is the Obesity Action Coalition. They have tons of great stuff on there. And then another one is um, healthywomen.org, Beyond the Body. They have very different approaches. One is like a much more holistic um, story sharing approach. And the other one is a lot of um, um, links and uh, evidence to support patients. <laughs> All right, so in summary, Obesity is a medical condition, so we should examine our personal biases and focus on patient-centered counseling regarding medical risks and concrete strategies to improve health outcomes. One quarter of pregnancy complications like hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, GDM, preterm birth, and LGA are attributable to maternal obesity or overweight. And a multidisciplinary approach involving nutrition, anesthesia, MFM, and bariatric surgeons in appropriate populations may be helpful. So these are my references. And uh, I wanna say thank you everyone for your time and attention and pause here for questions. So Dr. Delapiana, I'm gonna take the license of the first question, mm -hmm. um, even though I see a couple already pending for you. So really great um, overview of obesity and pregnancy. And I love sort of the focus on management um, and how to do that differently. So with that in mind, um, you did bring up um, obstructive sleep apnea, which I'll admit, I didn't realize had that dramatic of effects um, on pregnancy outcomes. Do you know if treatment of it then mitigates those effects or is it just like having the sleep apnea at all? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I didn't dig too deep into it, but the main concern is the hype hypercapnic or hypoxemic episodes contributing to increased risk. And so ergo, if you are preventing those with CPAP, then uh, risks should be improved. And then I'll go to Dr. Haas since hers is in the chat and then Dr. Bernstein. So for Dr. Haas, she asks, what about low-dose aspirin in patient status post-bariatric surgery? Yeah, great question. So I have looked into that before and it's hard to find like a very clear answer. So I would say since we are comfortable using low dose aspirin in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease, which is kind of a similar milieu of uh, um, sensitivity to NSAIDs, then I would say that we should also consider them safe in patients with bariatric surgery, unless their bariatric surgeon says otherwise. Great. And Dr. Bernstein. Yeah, Gabby, terrific uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, about 20 years ago, in collaboration with two Cedars nutritionists, I wrote and published a book called Carrying a Little Extra, A Guide to Healthy Pregnancy for the Plus Size Woman, and mm -hmm. researched whatever the state of the art was, both in understanding obesity and in, in the complications, which haven't changed. Um, and pointed out in that book that, you know, being obese isn't your fault. Uh, being obese is a genetic and metabolic disease. And it, it kind of blows my mind that it's taken 20 years for physicians to finally get that. And um, I think it has been because of the development of the GLP-1 agonists. Um, I would like to suggest that you think about a clinical trial where you start obese patients on these drugs, and I bet the drug company would just love to fund it, um, and then look at the obstetrical outcomes, because many obese patients cannot lose weight with these drugs because they're too expensive if they're on uh, Medicaid, it's not covered, you know, insurance coverage, um, even if you have insurance for some people, the copay is, you know, is too expensive. But if those drugs could be provided and those patients could then lose a significant amount of weight prior to becoming pregnant, and, you know, obviously you'd have to discontinue the drug during the pregnancy, but I would bet you that the complication rate would be much lower. And, um, that would be a good thing. And then, you know, a, a way of getting, um, you know, Medicaid to cover it or, you know, other insurance uh, providers to be um, uh, 
more willing to cover the cost of that drug because it really is a game changer for obesity. Yeah, thank you for that comment, Dr. Bernstein. It's fun to know that your writing endeavors are also include this book on, because people who know Dr. Bernstein know she writes other things as well. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting thought, and that's why I feel like the registry would be helpful because it's known that patients who are on the GLP-1 agonists who discontinue the medication do have a rebound weight gain and uh, um, a pretty rapid increase in um, insulin. So like the page or in um, in insulin resistance and insulin needs. Like, so patients who are using it for diabetes treatment who have to discontinue uh, do need to increase their other management medications like insulin and metformin when it's discontinued. And so I actually am wondering if we're going to see an increase in complications, um, like if people are in a, like increase in congenital malformations, like are patients in a more um, hyperglycemic state in that embryologic period um, because they have discontinued their azembic, um, and uh, will that be relevant or will there be more gestational weight gain because the main tool they had in their arsenal pre-pregnancy they can't use in pregnancy and will that lead to other complications and so I think it's going to be um, interesting to find how uh, how this medication is affecting what we see. Yeah, but having just a registry may um, skew your population uh, to the women who have really good insurance, who have lots yeah. of money, et cetera, et cetera. So if, if you could recruit patients with a study where the drug would not depend on their insurance, um, you might get a much wider, ra diverse range of patients. Absolutely. It's an ambitious goal. <laughs> I'm going sorry, to pause our questions there um, and thank Dr. Delapiana for her incredible um, grand rounds this morning. Dr. Um, Acord has actually asked for a minute of our time uh, just to remind about uh, an also really important um, program that she's working on. So um, I will pause there, uh, let Dr. Acourt speak, and again, thank uh, Dr. Delapiana for her wonderful work. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. D. That was awesome. I learned a lot. I really appreciate it. So hi, everyone. Really very quickly, I'm Dr. Acourt. I just want to remind you all about our reproductive psychology program. Um, we've been in place since 2019 and grew over um, 2020 and 2021 to offer your patients uh, mental health care throughout their reproductive journey. So we have um, classes, we have support groups, we have therapy groups, we have individual therapy. Um, the very first step is to speak with our licensed clinical social worker and patient navigator. I am putting her uh, phone number right there. I recommend that you do like Dr. Kilpatrick and just put that phone number in your cell phone. Um, you may give that to your patients. Um, you may share our um, reproductive psychology program website with your patients. And we are happy um, and really grateful for your referrals. Um, and thank you so much. Have a great day.